what happens now is pieced together from the evidence of a number of sites in the Jordan Valley. It is a triumph of human adaptability. They knew this could never be a natural site for the huge grass colonies they once depended on. So they created their own miniature controlled landscape. They dug the ground. They took their own precious food stocks and sacrificed them for the future. This simple act was the beginning of a new way of life. It would ultimately transform the face of the earth. They were the world's first farmers. Late Natufian foragers had to adapt to new conditions their ancestors didn't recognize before, and they had two options in a way. One option was to move out, and the other option was to change the subsistence strategy, to change the way you make your living. It seems that the option to move out to other places did not take place or didn't take room among these discussions within the Natufians because you can imagine the people sitting there and saying moving north would mean conflict, war with other hunters gatherers. Why don't we solve it in a different way? And I can easily imagine some of the old females telling them, hey guys, the best way is let's try and reseed our fields. Let's try and cultivate our own plants so we can stay in the same places without moving too far away. The drought lasted for over a thousand years. But then, in less than a generation, the ice age of the younger Dryas ended. The world became wetter and warmer. At last, the weather was regular and reliable. Now, it was perfect for farming. This was a moment which has occurred only a few times in the history of the human species. These farmers invented a whole new way of life. Ten thousand years later, the archaeologists are probing the desert for traces of early farming in the Fertile Crescent. But it's a vast landscape, and the hills are now much drier. They know the first farmers spread out as their way of life developed. So where did they go? Philip Edwards has been thinking like a first farmer. He tried to see the land as they did. At Zad II, near the Dead Sea, the researchers got it right. Here are the precious remains of a farm. Just three huts in a very unlikely place. Now, the first thing that strikes us is, when we look around, is why here we have a particularly barren landscape. And this site is right in the middle of a treeless plain. Nothing grows here. They wouldn't have been able to rely on any um, rainfall here. This is probably equal to one of the driest places on Earth. Um, the kind of useful plant foods we find here, barley, uh, legumes, figs and pistachios, particularly the nuts, just could never have grown here. Instead, they would have grown wild in the surrounding hills. These foods were important. 
but they were very hard to reach. So what made the farmers choose Zad? Well, one good reason is that just a couple of kilometres away behind me is a natural spring, and that would, would have once flown right past the site and given a plentiful supply of uh, water. Also, this erosion really wasn't here. The land would have been uh, a much flatter plain. So what you did have here was a place to uh, have water trained, maybe, into cultivated fields. That's arguable, but that's one of the uh, best bets as to why people were here. In the rubble, the team discovered the vital proof of farming. They found the remains of burnt seeds in the fireplaces. Because there were so many, Edwards knew they must have been cultivated in the fields around the huts. So it's almost like this could be even maybe a kind of uh, gardener's or gardening station. Yeah, set out here to do that kind of work. By measuring the seeds sifted from this dirt, the scientists discovered something quite extraordinary. The seeds are bigger than wild varieties. It told them the barley had developed a cultivated strain. Without knowing it, these early farmers at Zad were taking charge of evolution. They were mimicking natural selection and creating the first domesticated varieties. One way in which the first cultivators may have selected would be by taking plants, which may have come from quite a long way away, and planting them and building up a population. Now, they would choose, for example, uh, a type of wheat which had a particularly large grain, which would give a high yield, or a barley which had, I don't know, a nice taste or something like that, and they'd bring these in and build up a population. Early gardeners began influencing the shape, size and structure of the grain, what scientists call their morphology. Over time, they made it much easier to harvest. The main difference between uh, domesticated cereals and wild cereals is in the morphology of the ear. Wild cereals uh, lose their grains at maturity, they fall to the ground. In the domesticated cereals, the ear stays intact. In fact, it waits for the harvester to come along and gather them. Cereal grains took many hundreds of years to change from their old, smaller ancestors to the bulging heads we recognize today. Now, the cereals were so much more productive but there was a downside. Crops had become a very serious and time-consuming business. A relentless chain of production, from harvesting to winnowing and grinding. It was very labor-intensive. Life was a lot less carefree. Storage had become a large enterprise. In fact, these farmers were the first to build specialized granaries. This new farming lifestyle came at a cost. In early farming burials, archaeologists have found knee and shoulder bones that are heavily deformed. Strain injuries caused by the business of grain processing. These people no longer had the time to make the beautiful mortars of the Natufians. Instead, they used practical workhorse tools to process large volumes of grain. 